Welcome back. <clears throat> Euclidean geometry as a model for space lies at the core of pre-industrial design. Specifically, Euclidean geometry is what makes the design techniques we're about to learn work for us consistently and reliably. For this reason, we'll need to build up a basic familiarity with Euclidean geometry. Euclidean geometry is widely seen to be the first area in Western mathematics that was defined in terms of a small set of definitions and assumptions called postulates, and then built deductively using logic. It's what we call an axiomatic system. In this tutorial, we'll unpack most of Euclid's definitions, postulates, and so-called common notions from book one of the elements. The Elements was Euclid's 2,300-year-old textbook on plane geometry. And I'll leave a link in the description, but there is a terrific online, interactive, navigable version of The Elements that was prepared by David E. Joyce at Clark University. And his is the translation that we'll be basing all of our work off of as we, as we go through selected parts of the elements. So these definitions, postulates, and common notions are what we'll get the most use out of. And with a few exceptions we'll, we'll uh, look at later, they're going to serve as foundations upon which we build our pre-industrial design techniques. <clears throat> So we're going to get started um, just illustrating uh, the, the definitions first from, from book one of the elements. And so I'm going to state these. I'll illustrate them with a picture. I'm not going to offer a ton of commentary. Uh, and that way you can, you can review the, the actual wording by going back to David Joyce's um, posted version of the elements later on. So anyway, a point. Definition one is that which has no part. Think of it as a location pinpointed in space. The next three definitions have to do with lines and curves, and the first definition is a line. Now Euclid says this is a breadthless length. As far as Euclid was concerned, lines could be curved. So lines are what we more modernly think of as curves. They could be straight, they might not be. The extremities of a line are points. And these are the points at the end of a line or curve. A straight line well that's what we most often think of as a line segment these days but Euclid calls it a line which lies evenly with the points upon itself. So it's going to look something like that. Okay, the next few definitions have to do with surfaces, and of course the first one, definition five, is for a surface. So Euclid says a surface is that which has length and breadth only. So you can think of it as a curved sheet that has no thickness in space. The extremities of a surface, get a piece of colored chalk for this, though I might regret it if it doesn't erase well from my board. We'll try it out. The extremities of a surface are just the, the um, lines which 
performance boundary. So those red curves at the edge of the surface are its extremities. A plane surface, definition seven, is a surface which lies evenly with the lines on itself. In more general terms, a plane surface is a flat, thin sheet. So the next few definitions have to do with introducing the concept of an angle. And so a plane angle is the inclination to one another of two lines in a plane which meet each other and do not lie in a straight line. So remember, lines in Euclid's terms can be curved. And so that corner where they intersect is a plane angle. Now, uh, a, um, when the lines containing the angle are straight, then that angle is called rectilinear, and that's maybe more of what we commonly think of when we use the word angle. There's a rectilinear angle. Definition 10 really stands by its own. It's an important one. It defines what a right angle is. And so, if you've heard the term, it is what you think it is. But Euclid's definition of it, um, it's kind of long, so it's worth looking it up in David Joyce's printing of the, the elements uh, to make sure that you get it right. But anyway, it's when, when a straight line, standing on a straight line, makes the adjacent angles equal to one another. Each of the equal angles is right. And the straight line standing on the other is called a perpendicular to that which it stands. So, if you've got two straight lines that intersect in such a way this angle equals this angle equals this angle equals this angle. Then we say that those angles are right. And we say that those lines are perpendicular to each other. And we often indicate that by drawing a little square in one of the angle corners. Okay, the next two definitions continue on somewhat with the ideas of, of classifying angles. And these are two angles and acute angles. An obtuse angle is any angle that's greater than a right angle. An acute angle is any angle that is less than a right angle. Just terminology there. Let me introduce the ideas of figures in Euclidean geometry. A figure is that which is contained by only boundary. Oops, I, I've, I've skipped one. So uh, I need to give you the definition 13 first a boundary. So a boundary is that which is an extremity of anything. So we've seen some boundaries. These endpoints of the line were boundaries. These red lines or curves that formed the edges of that surface, those are a boundary. Okay. And that leads to Euclid's notion of a figure, and a figure is just that which is contained by any boundary or boundaries. So this 
surface that's interior to those red curves is the figure in that picture. Just like this flat surface, this flat planar surface inside of these four lines, straight line segments, also a figure. Much of what we construct in Euclidean geometry is a figure, and it's got a huge application to design because our furniture designs or architectural designs are really just made up of Euclidean figures. The next few of these definitions have to do with circles. Now, if you saw my first welcome video, I briefly got out this tool, my compass. The compass is how we draw circles in Euclidean geometry. We'll see why, oops, that is in just a minute. So Euclid's definition of, of a circle, he just flipped on me, is just a plane figure. So it's this region inside of this boundary. It's a plane figure contained by one line, this line, such that all the straight lines falling upon it from one point, one point in the interior of the figure, equal one another. So what we mean is that if we take a straight line from this one point in the interior and draw it so that it touches the boundary of this figure, or another one, or another one, or another one, or another one. Those are all supposed to be equal to each other. That's what makes a circle. Is that if you can draw this boundary line that is connected to a single point in its interior by any lines whatsoever that are all equal to each other. A more common way of saying that is the circle is the set of points that are equidistant from some center. Now there's a few other words that go along with circles. The center is just that point in the interior of the circle that is equidistant from all points along its boundary. A diameter is any line that passes through the circle, goes through its center, and intersects the boundary in two places, any straight line. So it's terminated in both directions by this boundary, which we call the circumference. It splits the circle into two equal halves. It bisects the circle. And those half circles are called semicircles. The center of a semicircle is the same point as the center of the circle that it was split off from. Okay. Now it's strange because we'll see soon that when talking about circles, Euclid introduces one other word that he's never defined. So we'll go ahead and define it here, even though it doesn't exist in Euclid's elements. These lines that we are drawing from the center of the circle out to its boundary, out to its circumference, one like this, those are called a radius. And a radius is just half the diameter of the circle. So Euclid didn't ever define it in the beginning of book one, uh, but he uses it, and so we're going ahead and defining it now. All right, and I'm out of board space, so I'm going to pause for a minute and erase, and then we'll move on with the rest of our definitions.
So now that we've established what circles and their related figures are, we move on and talk about or define some additional Euclidean geometry figures that, that are used a lot. And these are the rectilinear figures. A lot of times you might think of these as polygons, and that's, that's probably a good enough of equivalence, but I'll, I'll go ahead and start defining them. So a rectilinear figure are those which are contained by straight lines. Okay, so. There's a rectilinear figure. It's contained by, oh, what did I do? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven straight lines. But there are several special cases of rectilinear figures. Trilateral figures are those that are contained by three straight lines. We more commonly think of these as triangles. Quadrilateral. are contained by four straight lines. And then multilateral fig figures would be something like this. Any figure that is contained by any rectilinear figure that is contained by more than four straight lines. All right. Of the trilateral figures, an equilateral, so of the triangles, an equilateral, an equilateral triangle is that which has its three sides equal. So this is not equilateral because we can see that this side is shorter than this side, and this one is also shorter than this side. But an equilateral triangle, I can freehand it. we'll see that it has three equal sides. And we usually indicate that by drawing a single line through each of the sides that are equal. And later on, we'll see in more complex plane figures if we need to indicate that more than, then we've got additional pairs of sides that are equal, then we can just use multiple numbers of dashes drawn through them. So um, an isosceles triangle, this is all part of definition 20. Triangle with exactly two sides equal, but not three. So those two are equal. And finally, a scalene triangle. It's like the first trilateral figure that I drew. It, it, none of the sides are equal. There's more with trilateral figures. A right angle triangle. is a triangle where two of its sides are perpendicular to each other. An obtuse triangle. Has one obtuse angle in it. And an acute triangle. The triangle where all three angles are acute. So then we move on 
think I've got room to do this. And categorize some of the quadrilateral figures as well. I'll try to draw a small, maybe, but a square of the quadrilateral figures, a square is both equiangular and equilateral. In fact, Euclid defines it so that it's right angled and equilateral. Later on, we might see that, that that ends up being the same thing. We might prove that, but for now, I'll stick with Euclid's definition that it's square is equilateral, meaning all four sides for the same length and all four angles are right. An oblong is what Euclid's word is what was Euclid's word for what we often think of as a rectangle. An oblong is a quadrilateral figure that is not equilateral, but all four angles are right. A rhombus is the opposite of that. It's a quadrilateral figure where all four sides are equilateral, they're the same length, but they're, none of the angles are right. rhombus. And a rhomboid well, it's what you and I might think of these days as a parallelogram, but Euclid's definition of it is that it's any quadrilateral figure that has its opposite sides and opposite angles equal but it's neither equilateral nor right. I'm just about out of space here. All right, so that angle is equals that angle, or that side equals that side. That side equals that side. That angle equals that angle. That angle equals that angle. But all four angles aren't right, and all four sides aren't equal. And I'm out of space, but I'll make a little bit of room and say that every other quadrilateral thing, figure, I can spit those words out, every other quadrilateral figure, they're called trapezia. Something like this would be a trapezium. It's, there's, there's, uh, the sides are not equilateral. Um, the angles are not right. There's really no symmetry or structure. Okay. We're really down to one more definition. So I'm going to quickly clear off some space. definitions are going to give us quite a lot to work with as we build up our design techniques. And this last one's an important one. And it's, we define what parallel straight lines are. Definition 23 is for parallel straight These are lines which, being in the same plane and being produced indefinitely in both directions, do not meet one another in either direction. So they're, if you've heard the term before for parallel, they're what, you know, you probably think of them intuitively. If I were to draw one straight line and then another straight line, and then I could imagine doing something like taking a straight edge and extending 
these lines indefinitely in both directions. Not doing a very good job of it extending them straight, but you know, speed over accuracy right now. If we were to imagine extending those indefinitely in both directions, and no matter how far we extend them, they never meet, well then they're parallel. That's what Euclid means by parallel. And it's an important definition for us because a lot of times, you know, we're building and designing pieces of furniture where one edge of a component is going to be, comparable, going to be parallel to another. Think of like a shelves in a bookshelf or uh, two legs of a table. And so those are the 23 definitions that just describe the objects that exist in book one of, of Euclid's elements. As you go further on in the elements, you'll see that there's other definitions, but these are going to be the ones that we um, come back to the most. There's a few others that we'll see later on, but these are, these are what we're work, working with for now. With the 23 definitions of book one in place, we're now ready to move on to establishing Euclid's five postulates. Postulates are just true or false statements, assertions really, that we assume to be true. And by doing that, we're really establishing the properties of Euclidean geometry. We're establishing some of the relationships that exist between these terms that we've already defined using our definitions. And so we'll go ahead and write those down now. The So there's five of them, but the first postulate in Euclid's terms is to draw a straight line from any point to any point. And what that means is that if you specify two points in the plane, then it's always possible to connect them with a straight line. And remember, a straight line is a line that lies evenly upon itself um, and all the points on it. <clears throat> so this tool, a straight edge, is the first of two tools of Euclidean geometry construction that we use to model straight lines. So we use this to realize or approximate what we mean by connecting two points with a straight line. Now, postulate two also has to do with straight lines. And what it says is to produce a finite straight line continuously in a straight line. Kind of obtuse language, but that's, what, that's the way it's translated from Euclid. And what it means is that if you took a straight line like this one that you had constructed from one point to another, if you needed it to be longer, you can make it longer. And all you need is your straight edge. <coughs> You line your straight edge up with those two points, and extend the line. You could do the same thing in the other direction. And you can do that indefinitely. You can make a finite straight line as long as you want it to be just by extending it with your straight edge. The third postulate has to do with circles, and it introduces our second primary tool for doing geometric constructions, doing, doing our figures in Euclidean geometry. And it says, to describe a circle with any center and radius. And so the way that works, remember what a circle is, is this in, in our modern kind of paraphrase of the definition, it's just the set of points that are equidistant from some given point from the center. Well, we pick a center, there's our center, and we pick a radius, and we set our compass to, so that the tips of the compass are as far apart as we want our radius to be long. Once we've done that, we take the non-marking tip of the compass and put it on our center point, 
and then trace the marking tip. all the way around. And since the distance between these two tips never, never change, this parameter, this line, is going to be the set of points that are this distance away from the center. So that third postulate not only tells us how to construct one of our defined figures, a circle, it introduces a um, uh, indirectly, it introduces one of our tools of Euclidean geometry, the compass. Fourth postulate says that all right angles equal one another. Back in the definitions, we saw that right angles were defined by the concept of if you can draw two lines that intersect each other in such a way that the four angles made are all equal to each other, then those angles are right. So what this postulate is telling us is suppose you find a way to actually construct two lines that intersect each other so that all four angles are equal to each other and hence are right. Then what it's telling us is that if you were to come up with some other way of constructing two other lines, where those four angles are equal to each other and therefore right. There's no way these four angles can be equal to anything other than these four angles. In other words, there's not two values for the measure of a right angle. There's only, once you've established a right angle, there's only one size for that. What this postulate does not do yet is give us a direct way of constructing accurately two lines that intersect each other at right angles. For that, we're going to need to go into the propositions later on. And that'll be the subject of a future session. There's one more postulate. This is the one that always has caused people problems historically in mathematics because it's not as easy to accept as a common sense believable postulate, although it's still necessary for Euclidean geometry. And it says that if a straight line falling on two straight lines makes the interior angles on the same side less than two right angles, I'm going to pause and draw that. So we've got a postulate five. We've got a straight line falling on two other straight lines such that oops, the two angles, two interior angles on one side, if you were to measure them and add up their measures, it comes out to be less than the measure of two right angles. And by the way, in modern terms, it's just saying that they're going to sum up to some measure that's less than 180 degrees. Well, if that happens, fifth postulate says that if you were to turn around then and extend these two lines on that side indefinitely, they're eventually going to meet. Now, this postulate is called the parallel postulate, and that's because it, it really ends up being an indirect test that we can use for determining whether or not two lines are parallel. What it really does is it gives us a direct test for determining if two lines are not parallel. Because we start with two lines, these. We wonder if they're parallel. Well, we can check by drawing a third line that crosses both of them. And then if on one side of that third line, the two interior angles that are made, if we can somehow measure them and determine that the sum of those measures is less than 180 degrees, less than two right angles, then we know that on that side, those two lines are going to intersect somewhere if we produce them out indefinitely. And that would mean they're not parallel because two parallel lines, two straight lines in the plane that are parallel, if you produce them out indefinitely in either direction, by definition, they never intersect. 
So this parallel postulate gives us a way of testing to see if two lines are not parallel. Well, and so you could extend this and we'll later on see that, look, if these two interior angles do sum up to two right angles, we're going to be able to conclude that then the two lines initially were parallel. Okay, so that's it for the postulates. So these are five true or false statements that we have now assumed without proof to be true, and that lays the formal logical foundation for Euclidean geometry. Now, I could say not so fast because there are five more pieces of information related to at least the first book of the elements, the first book of Euclidean geometry that we need to establish. And these are the common notions. And really, in modern terms, common notions are just going to be either definitions or postulates, but they're often a little bit simpler. But Euclid chose this other concept of common notions to be a part of his logical foundations, and so we'll, we'll use that as well. So we'll write them out and illustrate them. The common notions are as follows. So the first one says, things which equal the same thing also equal one another. So look, suppose I had two quadrilaterals. Quadrilateral A, quadrilateral B, and they're equal to each other. I, I determined somehow that they're equal to each other. But then, if I had a third quadrilateral, quadrilateral C, and I knew somehow it was equal to B, then these two are equal to each other, these two are equal to each other, and so what common notion one tells us is that A must equal C. This is true for line segments, for triangles, for circles, really for any figure in Euclidean geometry. The next common notion says if equals are added, added to equals, then the holes are equal. So, let's imagine I had a square that I'm going to add onto a rectangle. And that square is equal to another square. And that rectangle is equal to another rectangle. And so if I add this square to this rectangle, I'm going to get a longer, skinnier rectangle just by merging them. If I add this square under this rectangle, I'm going to get another longer and skinnier rectangle. And so what common notion two says is that if you take equals, add them to equals, then the resulting figure that you get, figures that you get are going to be equal as well. And then in a sense, common notion three establishes the reverse of that. It says that if you've got two equal figures, right, common notion three says if you've got two equal figures and you subtract some equal parts, I'm going to subtract an equal square that's equal to this square off of each of these figures. And what I'm going to be left with are these two equal smaller rectangles. Common notion four says things which coincide with one another equal one another. So, imagine I had a triangle. And that triangle coincides with another triangle. Then those two triangles are equal. And again, this is true for any figure in Euclidean geometry. And the last common notion, common notion five, states that the whole is greater than the part. So if you had some figure and you cut it into two parts, then the whole figure is greater than either of those two parts alone. So that's 
That's what's stated by the five common notions of Euclidean geometry, at least from book one. And so that's a lot. That's a lot to digest at once. Uh, and so we ought to comment on it a little bit and just see, just to see what the value of all of this is. And so that, you know, the definitions, they are our geometric vocabulary. They're the words that we need to know in order to develop figures that we're going to use in design. The postulates are assertions that we assume to be true about our geometry. So they, they tell us the basic foundational facts of how our elementary definitions work together to make more complex geometric structures. The common notions are a little bit of both, as I've said. You know, normally we'd, we'd, in a more modern system, we'd probably not have common notions. We would just take those statements and write them either as definitions or postulates. Uh, so they serve kind of the same purposes there. So we should be left wondering about several questions at this point, but there's at least two that I want to maybe ask for you. You certainly might have more, and that, that's okay. So the first one I'd, I'd, I'd say that's important is that we need to, you know, we've got our definitions, postulates, and common notions that all tell us about various geometric objects, but how do we know they exist? Can we realize or construct them? So what I mean by that, is that imagine the circle. We defined the circle as a set of all points that are equidistant from a given center. But just because we defined it, that didn't mean that a circle could be drawn. And so it took our postulate three to tell us that you can do it in Euclid. So a part of Euclidean geometry is the possibility of drawing a circle. And then for convenience, we introduce a tool that we can use to approximate a circle, to model one when we're drawing our figures on paper. So there's a lot of other definitions that were made. Equilateral triangles, squares, right angles, things like that. Parallel lines that we describe a situation, but we don't know that we could ever realize it. So do we have a constructive way using our compass and how do you be organized here and hang this up, our straight edge? Do we have a constructive way that we can produce those types of figures? Another good question would be, how does any of this help us with designing furniture? That's, that's our goal here. This isn't just another course in Euclidean geometry. We're trying to apply it to furniture design or perhaps even architectural design. So how does it help us with that? And so to answer these questions, and more like it that you might have, we really need to develop some more of Euclid's work. We need to develop his propositions. And propositions are also assertions that are about the way the different defined terms in Euclidean geometry interact with each other to create more complex structures. But unlike the postulates, we'll actually deductively pr prove that these propositions are true. We don't just assume that they're true. Um, in Euclidean geometry, in, in the elements, there are 465 postulates, uh, 465 uh, propositions, I, I mean, in total. Fortunately, for the purposes of design, we'll only need to work with a small fraction of these. So we'll prove some of them, not, not all of them. And that process is going to begin in our next several sessions. And then shortly after that, we'll finally have enough in place that we can begin really unpacking what it means to design furniture or other objects in a pre-industrial way with our, our simple tools like the um, compass, straight edge, maybe some squares and, and things like that. So thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next session.